Good evening. Um, my name is Dr. Ted Gregorius. I'm a member of um, California Orthopedic Specialist. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about rotator cuff injuries and treatment options. So just a little background about myself. Um, I attended medical school here locally in Southern California at Loma Linda Medical School. And then I did my residency and my fellowship training at um, University of Florida in Stanford. I currently practice um, at California Orthopedic Specialists where I have a big portion of my practice that's focused on shoulder surgery. So let's go ahead and just dive right into it and start talking about the anatomy of the shoulder. So when most of my patients come into clinic, I try to familiarize them with the basic understanding of anatomy about the shoulder because there's a lot of confusion about the rotator cuff. And I often hear people refer to it as rotator cup, and there's a, there's a lot of misunderstanding. So I know it's a little bit of a busy slide, but I wanted to explain to you that the shoulder is basically a ball and hitch joint that's attached by the rotator cuff. So in this picture, you can see the head of the humerus, which is the bone here in the shoulder, and it attaches to the glenoid, which is on the scapula, and it's attached to the rotator cuff. And it's fairly easy to understand because the ball is held in the socket by the conglomeration of these three tendons. So there's, there's four important tendons of the cuff that hold the ball to the force couple. And so you can see them here on the screen and we see the supraspinatus is the tendon that's on the top, the subscapularis is the one in the front, and the infraspinatus and teres minor in the back. So together they form a cuff just like my, the, the scrubs on my, um, my shirt. So um, this is a closer look at the anatomy. So deep is the rotator cuff, and then more superficial is the deltoid, which covers the entire area. So you can't actually feel the cuff per se, but this is one of the reasons why people with rotator cuff tears or with impingement might feel symptoms, and it often refers to the deltoid. And in this slide, you can see where the deltoid covers the shoulder and ends down in the mid portion of the humerus. So it's important to understand why the rotator cuff functions the way it does, because it holds the ball within the joint, much like a hinge, excuse me, like a, 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 um, a trailer hitch would. And so it pulls the, the shoulder into the joint and the deltoid pulls upward. So they're almost counteracting forces. So if, if one of the forces is off, the shoulder will rise and it'll be difficult to raise the arm. So this is an example of a rotator cuff tear, and this, this cartoon shows a right shoulder as a person's looking at me, and I'm looking at directly th through, and I'm seeing the top tendon of the rotator cuff is torn. This is one of the most common injuries that we see in uh, sports medicine. So rotator cuff injuries often are associated with what's called impingement. So once the cuff is torn, the humeral head then rises and it pinches on the top of the acromion. In this picture, you can see this person who's having their arm abducted from the side is developed impingement or has impingement syndrome. So this is a closer look at impingement. So with the arm down at the side, it's not gonna pinch on the bone, but as the arm is raised, the outside of the shoulder comes in contact with the undersurface of the acromion and causes impingement. So this is, people often ask me, well, what do you see from an x-ray? So if a rotator cuff is really bad, I'm gonna be able to pick that up from an x-ray. So on one side of our screen, on the left side, you're gonna see um, a rotator cuff that's been torn and the humeral head is sort of floated upward and it's resting on the undersurface of the acromion bone. Whereas the view on the right, you can see that the head is nicely centered into the socket. So while we can't say that there's not a rotator cuff tear on the right shoulder, we can definitely say there's a torn rotator cuff on the left, an otherwise known as rotator cuff arthropathy and changes how we would manage the care of that patient. So x-rays are an important step in evaluating someone's shoulder, whether it's arthritis or a rotator cuff tear. So, so what, what causes rotator cuff injury? So some, some people think that rotator cuff results in, or, I mean, in secondary impingement. Some people believe that as a result that it worsens the tear. As the head rises, it attritionally rubs on the cuff, so it causes to weaker and weaker um, lifting of the shoulder and eventually to rotator cuff arthropathy where a person can't lift their shoulder or abduct it from their side. So how do you know if you have a rotator cuff injury? So some of the common symptoms, again, are gonna be referred pain to the side of the del deltoid, a dull aching pain. One of the most common complaints we get is night awakening when someone rolls onto their shoulder and it'll wake them up, they'll feel pain, a sleep disturbance, um, and then active but not passive motion loss. So you can lift your hand, but you can't actively move it. You can't comb your hair or reach behind your back. All common symptoms of rotator cuff tear or impingement. 
So, so what, what's the cause of the rotator cuff tear? So as many things, tendons wear down or are trite with age. So at age 60, roughly 28% of the population has a rotator cuff tear, and by 70, upwards of 60% have a rotator cuff tear. So we know as we age, our blood supply attenuates. Um, other, other common um, injuries today in clinic, for example, I saw someone who fell backwards and put their hand outstretched and they felt a pop. So that's a classic fall and a rotator cuff tear. Other times it happens from repetitive motion and people have persistent pain in their shoulder with night waking that will bring them in. So you can have acute or chronic rotator cuff tears, but chronic rotator cuff tears are a result of, of an attritional wear of the cuff accompanied with age, whereas acute or immediate rotator cuff tears come as a result of a fall um, or an accident. Some of the other issues can come up with smoking history and family history of rotator cuff pathology. So what happens if you don't do anything and you have a rotator cuff tear and you say, you know what, I'm just going to manage this. I'm not going to go see my doctor. So half of the rotator cuff tears that have no symptoms become symptomatic, meaning that people lose motion or they have pains within two to three, of, of two to three years of those tears becoming identified. And then half of those rotator cuff tears that are painful then go on to progress and become bigger rotator cuff tears as time goes along. So, so what, are your, what are your options, right? So you need to see your primary care doctor or if you have the option, if you know an orthopedic surgeon who has a, a subspecialty training in the shoulder, you can go see your doctor and just clarify, say this is what's going on and get started on healing. So, so interesting enough, even though my job as a surgeon, the overwhelming majority of my patients are treated without surgery. So a good, um, resource is the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. There's a lot of information on that website for a home exercise program. And, you know, given the current um, COVID um, situation, it's a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to do these home exercises even prior to seeing your doctor, see if you can um, um, help aid in reducing the rotator cuff back. Um, some of these, um, these, this is on the screen, you can see the orthoinfo.aaos.org or just type in AAOS rotator cuffs and there's a lot of information there. In conjunction with the home physical therapy program, we often give formal physical therapy. And the reason that works is because the rotator cuff's redundant. So remember we talked about the anatomy of the four tendons. So if one of the tendons is torn, for example, the tendon on top, the three remaining tendons can be strengthened through specific exercises to pull the head back down and take it away from the acromion so there's less pain. So that's how, how physical therapy is actually scientifically shown to improve patients who have rotator cuff tears. So these are examples, some of the exercises that can do. So, so really pretty simple. So one of the exercises is simply internally rotating the arm against resistance, that's strengthening the subscapularis. And externally rotating against resistance is the infraspinatus and teres minor. And then forward elevation is the supraspinatus. So, you know, either with the conjunction with an injection or with anti-inflammatories, uh, this home therapy program helps pull that, that force couple back and restores the anatomy of the shoulder without surgery. So this is overwhelming one of our first options in treating patients with rotator cuff injuries. So another um, valuable resource we have are um, anti-inflammatories. Um, anti-inflammatories can play a role um, in reducing the inflammation that's not an injection, but it's a short-term treatment option. So ibuprofen or over-the-counter, um, naproxen, um, prescription Mobic or Meloxicam um, can be effective strategies for a short term, anywhere from four to six weeks, but it's not something we really want to encourage long term because of the side effects. Um, so corticosteroid injections play an important role, and I often tell patients that they're diagnostic, therapeutic, and prognostic. So what I mean by that is by doing the injection, again, another example is a young gentleman I saw today in clinic, he had ongoing symptoms of pain, and he said, well, this relieved my pain right away. I said, if it's your, if it's your impingement or your rotator cuff tear, you'll notice immediately. And by the time I pulled the needle out, his pain was already diminished significantly. So the immediate effect of the lidocaine that's combined with the steroid helps report to the patient and to the surgeon that my pain's improved. So, um, so that helps you get into a physical therapy program. It's therapeutic because of the, the, the role corticosteroid plays. So that can last anywhere from 30 to 60 days, help you get into a physical therapy program and then restore the function of the remaining tendons of the rotator cuff. Um, and also, it's going to give us, you know, the diagnostic purposes long term, this is someone who would be a candidate for having their shoulder fixed. Now, on the other hand, there's 
there's there's a, a line in the sand that you want to draw somewhat with doing um, corticosteroid injections is um, many corticosteroid injections can hurt the rotator cuff because it damages the tissue. And so when you go to repair it, the tissue becomes more friable or weakened. So you go from a situation where the rotator cuff feels thick like canvas and is very, very strong to being like paper mache. And so unfortunately, there are those patients that had multiple injections and those rotator cuffs are harder to fix. So we don't recommend more than three injections um, because of the complications. They don't heal the cuff, they just take away the pain. They mask it so you can get into therapy. There's other injections um, that we, we can do. Um, they're not first line treatments. Um, we don't recommend them as primary treatments for rotator cuff injuries, but stem cells and PRP are playing an increasing role. And as the literature comes through, that's something that we do offer our patients, but it's not a first line modality that we use. We prefer the therapy, simple corticosteroid injection and anti-inflammatories. So what if pain continues and you're not improved and you've been in physical therapy? A typical time that will wait for a non-acute rotator cuff tear, meaning that someone who has uh, increasing attritional pain in their shoulder, we re really recommend about anywhere from three to six months of physical therapy to see if they can get their force couple restored and pull that shoulder back down. And then, of, of course, after the physical therapy and is an injection, either with just lidocaine or and or with steroid, we, we get an MRI and then referral to an appropriate orthopedic surgeon, and then typically someone who has training in um, specialty in shoulder surgery. So the reason the MRI is valuable because it allows us to look at the soft tissue and it helps us explain to our patients what, what the best plan is in addition to looking at the current condition of the cuff. So this is looking at a right shoulder and you can see that there's a fairly significant rotator cuff there on top and it's showing that the end of the tendon is torn. And so that in, in this situation, we be able to tell the patient, well, this is a really big tear. This is probably not an acute tear. This is more of a chronic tear. So it, it helps us show those different types of things, helps us strategically plan what's involved with surgery and what type of surgery we may or may not need to do. So surgery for the rotator cuff can be done in many ways and there's no correct way to do it. Um, I was trained in an arthroscopic technique. Um, some people do it mini open. There's no perfect way. The best way is based upon your surgeon's preference. So you don't want to talk your surgeon to an arthroscopic technique if he or she is more comfortable doing a mini open technique through a small incision. So training has the training sur surgeon preference has most to do with the outcome of the patient. So in my hands, I'm best doing an arthroscopic procedure through a video camera. So this is this is. Um, my technique, I prefer an all arthroscopic repair, and, and, and if it can be fixed, it can be fixed through the scope. So some people say it's too big, it needs to be open. It's really surgeon preference, as I said. Um, some advantages are less scar. The surgical time is usually about an hour um, of actual cut time where you're putting the camera in and repairing the rotator cuff. And then my preferred technique is to do a knotless procedure. So this is an example on the right-hand side of your screen of a big rotator cuff tear. So you're sort of looking down there into the top of the humeral head and you're seeing that opening, and then you see those convergent sutures being placed across in the slide B, and it's pulling the cuff together, and ultimately the repair and slide D. So open um, surgery can be done, this is an example, through, it's, it's made through a saber incision, it's about that long in the shoulder, um, and that can be done without a, a video camera. And they open, the surgeon can repair it down through bone, and that's the classic way to do a rotator cuff. Again, what's most important is what your surgeon is most comfortable with, so you have to ask what he or she prefers to do and what technique they like to use. Um, again, for me, arthroscopic surgery is the most effective because just strategically, it's less operating time for me. It's about an hour for the procedure and the three or four poke holes in the shoulder. It's all done as outpatient and often accompanied by an interscaling block, which numbs up the entire extremity. Um, it really helps minimize the use of narcotic pain medicine after surgery. So, so what's involved in the rehab? That's a, a, that's a very common question I get, right? So for example, most rotator cuffs, the surgery is about an hour and a half um, to an hour. And you're seen in clinic the following week. I usually provide my patients with a video of the surgery and pictures showing the interoperative you know, before and after. And then I bring them back to clinic and I start physical therapy in the very first rate. Physical therapy is inherently important to um, getting good outcomes for patients in my, hand, my practice and I, everyone goes to physical therapy. Um, you're in a sling for about four to six weeks, depending on the size of the rotator cuff tear. And then you really reach kind of your, your first um, mark at about three months where you have, you've returned to full range of motion. 
You may have some discomfort with your shoulder, but you return to many of your functions of activities of daily living. You're not back to sports yet. By six months, we return you to your sporting activities such as golf and tennis um, and other sports you like to play. And by 12 months, we consider you, you healed and um, prepared to return to all your activities. So what happens in the situation where you can't repair a rotator cuff? Um, it's been too long. Maybe there's some arthritis in there. This is an example of a patient who has a, what's called a massive rotator cuff tear. On the right-hand side of the screen, we can see the tendon has been pulled back and retracted all the way. So it's, it's too far to pull over it. It won't hold a suture. Even if we pull it over and able to mobilize that, that person's likely to fail their, their rotator cuff repair. So there's really two options. So depending on the patient's age and how many tendons are torn, they either there's a shoulder replacement option, um, which is called a reverse arthroplasty. And that's a very effective strategy for someone who's had a rotator cuff tear for a long time, has gone untreated. Um, and the, the newer prosthesis, have, they're very promising. Um, that's done as in, typically as an inpatient surgery. It can be done as outpatient. It takes about an hour and a half to do that procedure. And we reverse the ball and socket joint. So we put the socket on the ball side and reverse it. And so it tensions the, the big muscle of the deltoid and allows patient to return to function with a full range of motion um, and really mitigate their pain control. So that's a, that's a great option for people that have no rotator cuff tear, excuse me, have no rotator cuff intact or have rotator cuff arthropathy, meaning they have a significant amount of the tendons are gone. Um, there's another option, and I enjoy doing this procedure. It's called the superior capsular reconstruction. And so in this example, the cartoon on the left is a rotator cuff that's torn, but there's still some of the tendons that remain intact. So what we do is we take an um, acellular dermal graft and we roll it up like a burrito. And we sink it in through the shoulder, through the, the portal sites, and you can see that little cannula. A cannula is a tunnel that we operate through, and we plant that and it depresses the head, and then we use sutures all the way around to, to transplant that tissue into the shoulder. And it's very much like a rotator cuff repair. Patients can regain full function, return to their activities. It's a very promising um, procedure, um, something I've really enjoyed doing over the past um, you know, many years, and I've, I've found very good success with the procedure. So I see a lot of patients that have irreparable rotator cuffs. They're eligible for this specific procedure, which is offered at Hogue Hospital. So something exciting that we really enjoy doing in our practice. Um, um, we look forward to seeing you and answering any of your questions. Um, again, I can be um, reached at um, tgregorius at calortho.org. Um, and um, um, <laughs> calortho.org with any questions that you may have. Um, again, that's my email. And if there's any questions that you guys may have, I'm happy to answer them this evening for you. Oh, here we go. So we have some questions. So the first question, is it concerning that I have audible popping on the shoulder? So um, this, this can mean it's crepitus. So the noises are not necessarily um, an issue unless it's accompanied with pain. So just popping noises in the shoulder are not overwhelmingly concerning unless, you, unless it's accompanied with pain. And I do recommend seeing your doctor if you have pain accompanied with the crepitus or the popping and locking noises. Um, but yes, it could be a rotator cuff um, issue. That's a, good, that's a good question, one I often, uh, often hear. But just the poppy noises alone does not mean you have a cuff tear, but if it's accompanied with pain, it's something that I do recommend having um, your doctor take a look at. So another really important question, again, um, um, I was talking quite fast, so I apologize for that, but what is the average recovery time for rotator cuff injuries? So. Most of my patients are in a sling for, for four weeks, and by the end of four weeks, they come out of the sling, and by the end of um, six weeks, they're able to fully lift their hand above their head. Um, by 12 weeks, they have minimal, minimal to very little pain. Again, barring any complications or stiffness, most people are doing very well by 12 weeks, and a lot of people I have to tell, again, I saw a really great gentleman this evening who I did a cuff repair on four and a half months ago, and he's wanting to golf and go back to all his activities, and said, please just be careful, go slow, don't rush it, um, let that cuff heal in, But because he, he has no pain, he thinks that it's healed, so it, it does take some time, so the normal time would be six months back to all your activities. If it's a very small cuff tear, it can, it can speed up a little bit, for, but on average, I would say six months. Again, a very good question. 
So rehabilitate. The, the next question is how important is rehabilitation in the treatment of a rotator cuff tear? So I would say very important. Um, again, I think that using a therapist or someone knowledgeable can really aid in helping restore the function of the force couple. Again, you're trying to bring the head back into the joint and restore those muscles. So prior to surgery and even after, physical therapy plays an important role. Most of my patients receive 24 to 36 visits of physical therapy after their surgery, um, and we're very involved. So, for example, after the operation, the, um, we'll send the patient home with a copy of their operative report, pictures of their surgery. Um, they'll receive a protocol. So if it's a small rotator cuff tear, it's different than a medium rotator cuff tear. If it's a medium, it's different than a large and then a massive. So we have protocols for everyone. They go to um, one of our therapists, and the therapist follows the protocol with the patient and helps restore that function through each phase of therapy. So by the time they get to 12 weeks, they're doing very, very well. And by the time they get to six months, um, the vast majority of patients are back to their full activity level. So, so we have a couple more questions here. Thank you. So the question is, I have a lot of arthritis pain in my shoulder, so what are my options? So, so, so if it's confirmed that there's arthritis in the shoulder, the, the option is, is a shoulder replacement surgery, and that's been a very effective strategy for um, taking care of um, um, shoulder pain. So there's two types of shoulder replacements that we do. We do an anatomic shoulder replacement, which acts exactly like the old force couple and takes the same time to heal as a rotator cuff, takes about six months. Um, that's the anatomic shoulder replacement. And then we have the reverse for someone who has both arthritis and a rotator cuff um, tear. Again, the, the, the reverse is the heals a little bit faster. Patients are able to get back at about four months, but uh, six months with uh, someone who has a standard shoulder replacement. Again, that's, those are the two options. Outside of surgery, your options are a corticosteroid injection, so an injection to the ball and socket joint. Your doctor or can use an ultrasound, and we can put a small needle in there. And that's, it's really, again, it's very powerful because it's very diagnostic and therapeutic for a patient because they can feel the relief that they can get from a, a shoulder replacement and or avoid surgery. Again, there's some other, what I think are probably more controversial things, but we do use our platelet-rich plasma or PRP. Um, that's in common usage now. But again, I steer most of my patients toward FDA-approved um, um, things like the corticosteroid and then shoulder replacement. So you have a lot of options with your shoulder arthritis and getting an effective strategy for pain control by a shoulder replacement. Um, but again, the best part is just to see your doctor and look at and see how advanced your arthritis is in your shoulder. Um, so another question here is, what is the lack of cartilage versus a tear? So that's a good question because it does get confusing. So cartilage is where the ball interfaces with the joint. So the ball and socket, if the cartilage creates a layer between the two and reduces friction. The rotator cuff, on the other hand, is the tendon surrounding the ball and socket. So you can tear the cartilage, and there's other types of injuries to the shoulder that we treat. For example, a labrum tear. So that's the gasket that's deep inside the shoulder beneath the rotator cuff. So oftentimes that can be confused as a type of, um, of um, cuff tear, but that is also treated by um, fixing or repairing it arthroscopically, and we do a lot of those procedures as well. Um, lack of cartilage, again, is arthritis. So a lot of people get confused about arthritis, but arthritis just means that something's worn, the cartilage is worn down, and there's many reasons that you can get arthritis. One is just your activities, um, your age, um, maybe you're a really athletic person. So I see very young people with arthritis. It's not necessarily age-related. It can be activity-related, and there are some disease processes that can also cause arthritis, such as um, autoimmune diseases um, that cause an inflammatory process. So all those can cause a lack of cartilage or arthritis versus a rotator cuff tear. But if they occur, occur in conjunction together, then again, we look at the treatment options that are more toward the shoulder replacement and the arthroscopic rotator cuff repairs.